adventure, exploration, discovery. The most explosive four centuries in the history of mankind. This is the golden age of science and technology. Working today at Brookhaven National Laboratory, firing streams of proton bullets at nuclear targets. <laughs> Photographing and cataloging the fragments. At Lamont Geological Observatory, working with carbon-14. A sample of ancient wood is burned. The radioactive decay is measured to calculate how long ago the wood was part of a living tree. At UCLA Medical Center, experimenting with animals to analyze the nature of learning and the functions of the brain. At Palomar Mountain, straining to perceive objects billions of light years away in the outermost limits of known space. And collaborating, astronomers at Owens Valley Radio Observatory who tune in bursts of radio energy, often from objects too faint to be seen even by the most powerful of optical telescopes. at the Smithsonian Jungle Laboratory in Panama, groping through a world of perpetual twilight. Exploring its plants and its animals in countless numbers and variety. Astronautics, nucleonics, geochronology, physiology, astronomy, botany, zoology. Many fields of science and technology, and yet common to every field, a basic similarity of attitude, a basic similarity of method for discovering truth. What is this method? Let's look for a rather simple but clear example in, of all places, the cloudy waters of a lagoon in Mexico. Scientists photograph specimens as they are gathered of Anableps dowie, often called the four-eyed fish. The scientist, first of all, has curiosity He's observed that Anableps' eye has two pupils. The upper pupil kept just above the water, the lower pupil just below. And that Anableps can see food or trouble coming from any direction, above or below, through air or water. Second, the scientist has imagination. He guesses that for Anableps' eye to work so efficiently, it must be constructed to adjust for the difference in index of refraction between air and water. And finally, the scientist has patience to check his guess, test his hypothesis through repeated experiments. As he works, he takes into account what he already knows about the nature of vision, for example. The human eye is much like a camera. It has a single pupil through which the light image enters. It has a lens to focus the image on the retina, which is like the film in a camera. How about Anableps eye? As we've seen, two pupils and inside two retinas to receive two images, but only one lens, which is shaped like an egg. As the Anableps glides along the surface, Light from an object underwater passes through the more sharply curved or stronger part of the lens. Light from an object in air passes through the less sharply curved or weaker part of the lens. 
Careful measurement shows that the focal length of the lower segment matches the index of refraction of water. The upper matches that of air. And so the original hypothesis seems correct. Anablepse is found to carry a set of built-in bifocals that enables the fish to see simultaneously and accurately through air and water. Curiosity, imagination. The patience to make repeated experiments. In broad terms, the scientific method. We think of this as modern, and so it is. And yet Roger Bacon set forth the principle almost 700 years ago. Bacon wrote, there are two methods of investigation, through argument and through experiment. Argument does not suffice, but experiment does. Seems obvious today, doesn't it? But it wasn't always so. Think back to ancient times, to the civilizations founded in the river valleys of the Indus, the Tigris Euphrates, and the Nile. It's true, they made remarkable advances in applied science or technology. Gadgets and devices and machines. Machines for cultivation. Machines for irrigation. Ships with oars and ships with sails, carts and wagons with wheels, weaving, pottery, metalwork, and mechanics. Great technology, yes, but no real growth in science as we know it today. Why not? Well, it certainly wasn't lack of intelligence. It was their attitude, their failure to recognize systematic law and order in the universe. When they looked at the stars, for example, they mixed the facts of astronomy with the fancies of astrology. A solar eclipse. Why does it occur, they wondered. Here was one answer. There is a huge, hungry dragon who prowls the heavens. Every so often he finds the sun god whom he quickly devours. Oh yes, luckily, just in the nick of time, the dragon always gets indigestion and has to spit out the sun god. Quite a concept. And yet, in the midst of darkness, a few flickering candles were lighted. Pythagoras and the theory of vibrating strings in music. Aristotle and the study of animal life. Archimedes, and the law of the lever. But these were just occasional flashes. Despite magnificent technology, the ancients remained in scientific darkness. They were too largely committed to what Bacon called investigation through argument instead of experiment. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, for example, argued something like this. The heavens are perfect. Motion in circles is also perfect. Therefore, all heavenly motion must be circular. This means that the sun, moon, and stars move in perfect circles around the earth. And the earth itself is the unmoving center of the entire universe. This theory was made rigid dogma by men who investigated the universe not through experiment, but by quoting the arguments of Aristotle. With such an attitude, no wonder there was phrenology instead of physiology, alchemy instead of chemistry. Yet even here, we owe a kind of debt to the past. They proved once and for all that mere argument leads only to superstition and error. By the 16th century, men like Copernicus had begun to realize this. Copernicus had curiosity, imagination, and the patience to make mathematical experiments based on observation. As a result, he conceived the sun instead of the earth 
as the hub of the solar system. Later, Tycho Brahe observed the heavens so carefully that he gave the mathematician Johannes Kepler the raw data to construct another dazzling hypothesis, that of elliptical rather than circular planetary motion. Galileo built a telescope to reveal the moons of Jupiter and spots on the sun. He too came to see that argument does not suffice but rather experiment to discover the laws of nature. And in 1687, Isaac Newton brought together a great series of scientific laws and showed them to be parts of a single mighty plan regulated by mathematical principles, Principia Mathematica. And Newton humbly described his own dedicated efforts to learn and obey those laws with the words, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. From this beginning, modern science has climbed in an ever-soaring curve. This curve has steepened so fast that it's now estimated almost 90% of all the scientists who ever lived are alive today. And why has this great explosion taken place? Simply because four centuries ago, there was a sudden, dramatic change in man's attitude. A change so complete, so overwhelming, that every scientist today accepts it without question. He no longer believes that investigation through argument is enough or that nature is capricious and unreliable. Instead, he investigates through experiment based on a firm conviction that nature is regulated by a system of rational laws. And he has made a personal commitment to discover and obey those laws. And for four centuries, the results have been and will continue to be explosive. For centuries, man has dreamed of a magic lamp from which he could conjure up an all-powerful servant. But always man has been tortured by doubts and fears of his ability to control the mighty genie. In our time, the dream has become reality. The genie of the lamp, modern science and technology, has been released and stands ready to grant our every wish, energy for the wheels of civilization, food and health and comfort for the peoples of the world, all this and much more. It's obvious. Each of us has a debt to the past in science and technology. But we also have a debt to the future. For unless properly controlled, instead of blessing, the powerful genie may curse. Why do we face this deadly peril? Simply because despite explosive growth in science and technology, we have had no comparable explosion of moral and spiritual growth. This fact is brutally evident all around us. <laughs> Clearly, the most desperate need of our time is a moral and a spiritual explosion but it can come about only in the same way as the explosion in science and technology. First, we must recognize that argument does not suffice, that there is law in the moral and spiritual realm. And second, we must make a personal commitment to learn and obey that law. Only then will we have the strength and wisdom to control the awesome power of modern science and technology and make it truly a 
useful and obedient servant to mankind.